from Holly, New York, and in front of the famous Jonathan Sperry House. <laughs> this is Gavin McLeod with Rich Cristiano coming to you. The Sperry film is really, really good. We're a skinny Italian bodyguard. Well, this may take a little longer than I thought. Say hi to the camera. My ankle hurts. One more! One more! <laughs> We're all happy. We're happy people. Okay, it's the first day. Got our first day jitters. This is Jonathan Sperry house. Um, wanted to shoot outside. Had a much easier day planned for the day, but it's going to rain. So we had to go inside to shoot this scene when Jonathan Sperry first meets Albert and Mark. The lemonade scene, as we call it. I love it already. Yeah. <laughs> Action. Would you like some more, Albert? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yes, it's very good. Mark? Yes, sir. I made it myself, you know. Not the easiest scene to start with first day of shooting when you've got your crew just up and running for the first time, but we have to do it. There's no other choice. Um, there's 10 setups today. May not sound like a lot, but it'll take all day to shoot it. Uh, a lot of shots, close-ups, tight space. Not the easiest first day for the crew. You know, you like to build momentum with the crew, get them up and running. But we got to do what we got to do. OK, quiet, please. Um, I will say this. As I go into this movie, obviously I'm anxious. We're shooting in upstate New York, where I grew up. It's a beautiful location up here. The weather is a real issue. So the crew and the cast has to be flexible. The rains, we got to go inside. When we get good weather, we shoot outside. So I'm hoping today will go smooth. And um, I really like my cast, though. I think these three kids, Jansen, Alan, and uh, Frankie, playing Dustin, Mark, and Albert, are going to be excellent. And I think the audience really like him. I think, obviously, Gavin McLeod is Jonathan Sperry. We've got Robert Guillaume coming in later. So hopefully, this movie's going to work. You never know until you put it together. I guess we'll shoot it, and we'll see what happens. But um, I'm fairly confident of the story. I'm very confident of my cast. And hopefully, this movie's going to turn out. We'll see. OK, cut it. I got the idea for the movie The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry back in the early 90s. I had the idea kicking around in my mind for like 10 years. I remember when I sat down to write this, all I had were scenes. I remember like, for example, I had the scene where the bully goes in and talks to Jonathan. So Dustin, who's the old timer? So I wrote that scene. I had the cemetery scene in my mind where Jonathan takes the kids to the graveyard. I wrote that scene. I knew the, how the movie was going to end, where Dustin was going to take the kids back to the graveyard. I wrote that scene. I remember I wrote 32 pages, and that's all I had. And I sent it to my brother Dave. He brought me in. I came on board. and just tried to work on a second storyline and so we came up with the idea where these one of the boys had like a crush on a, a girl. Hey Dustin. Hi Tanya. So I was trying to think of an idea where the audience knew something that happened but the boy didn't and so we had the idea where this little boy is going to write a note to this girl and by mistake the note's going to get thrown away and the girl never gets the note but the boy doesn't know it. I had written you a note and I'm sure to get my answer. Your answer? Get to the question I had written you on the note? What note? So he's wondering why she doesn't respond to the note. And so when you kind of come up with an idea, you just you know try to write it out and then just carry it through. And he sent me back the first 16 pages of the script. So now we had 48 pages. But because he put that Tanya storyline in there, I was able to finish the first draft. And my brother and I probably spent maybe two years kicking this draft back and forth Spending, you know, you might work on it for a month, for a little bit, and then take two months off and work on it again. He'll write something, send it to me. I'll look at his comments, edit, try to write something, send it back to him. And I mean, he lives in California. I live in North Carolina, so we just send it back through email. I remember the hardest thing for us to come up with was what we called the Tanya payoff. We had all these storylines that we resolved, but we didn't have the one resolved with Tanya. It took a while to come up with how to figure out how to do it, but in time we came up with something and. Hopefully it worked, I thought it worked. And then we finally got the idea that when Dustin is going to come and give her that note, that I think we take the audience by surprise, we pull a little switcheroo where the audience thinks Dustin's gonna ask her out and embarrass himself, and really he says, hey, 
you know, I want to tell you something important's happened in my life, which obviously is hopefully a good moment in the movie, and it really resolves that story. But it's just working the scripts. We both think alike, think the same. So I think we work for each other's story editors. I couldn't have done this script without my brother, though. Very valuable, and uh, he really had some terrific thoughts, and uh, thankfully the script came together. Brother Dan. I love our cast. Love them. First, let's start with Gavin. We wrote the movie for him. We knew we wanted him to play Sperry. I can't imagine anybody else playing Sperry. Gavin, first of all, loves the Lord. The movie means something to him, and I thought he was terrific. Well, Jonathan Sperry is, uh, you might just say, a kindly old man, but he wasn't always old, and he wasn't always kindly. And when he came to the Lord, his entire being changed. All of a sudden, they, he was seeing the world with new eyes. Jesus was his Lord and Savior, and the Bible was everything in his life. You know, many men have attacked this book in order to keep people from reading it. You see, I'm almost glad that this incident occurred today because it will not be easy for you to follow the Lord. And there will be many trying times ahead as you live your lives. But remember, the Lord is always with you. It was always a thrill to work with Gavin. He's very easy to deal with. Uh, Gavin and I, about a month before we started, I went over to his house and went through the entire script just to make our final changes. Gavin had a few suggestions, which were excellent, and we put those in there, and uh, just working with him is a joy. All the acting needs to be good, but the key to this film is really Dustin, played by Jansen Penetier. I play the character Dustin, and um, it's basically, well, I'm basically more of the main character. It's told through my eyes. And my two best buddies are Mark and Albert. I think I'm going to ask Tanya out on a date. I'm thinking about it. You ever asked a girl out before? No. Dustin has to be somebody that the audience feels for, they're endured to, and I really enjoyed working with Jansen. I'm telling you, this kid is so talented. I probably said 50 words to him the whole movie. Very few times that I have to say anything to him. He was just spot on with his character and his deliveries, and he was super. This is Albert forever. I don't care what else he plays. To me, he's Albert. You know, the biggest surprise in this movie to me has been Albert. Frankie Ryan Manriquez. As we show this movie to audiences, everybody loves Albert. Albert is a character that sometimes says things without thinking about it. We're just here waiting for Dustin. Uh, he's on his way to talk to you, Tanya. Talk to me? Yeah, he's gonna ask you out. And then he thinks about it and he's like, oh crud, like he's not supposed to just say that, but he just like says it and then he's like, why did I just say that? The comedy relief in this movie, we thought Albert was a good character. We were hoping to get some laughs from him, but I've really been surprised to watch the movie with audiences. They just love Albert, and uh, what a great kid, um, a joy to work with, knew his lines, very professional, really delivered on set. I am the best friend, I think is the word. Okay, okay. Alan Isensen, who played Mark, um, this was his first movie. And I think he's a perfect complement to those two guys who kind of play the brainy character. Yes. But he wasn't as experienced on set. And so he had to learn the, how to operate on set. It's not easy if you've never done it before. But I think he comes through beautifully. My character's like, he's very down to earth. And he's smart and realistic. And he, he helps his friends out a lot. But he also does like to joke around sometimes. Getting a little nervous. Why? He's just a girl. You're too young to understand. What do you mean? I'm just as old as you are. Yeah, but not in your brain. What's that supposed to mean? Like I said, you're too young to understand. Cut it out, guys. And he did a great job for us, and um, he was very interesting to work with him. That kid's going to be like a scientist or a doctor when he grows up. He's a brilliant kid. I'll take this one. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, hi, Nick. Nick. Nick was the hardest role to cast, and uh, I really appreciate Taylor. Taylor did a great job for us, and it's funny, Taylor, they all had to cut their hair, and let Taylor Boggin did not want to cut his hair. And I remember when he flew in the first day, um, his hair was still too long, and we, we had to make him cut it, and he was not a happy camper about it. And it just so happens, the very first shot I shot with him was when he walks away from Sperry after talking 
to Jonathan Sperry, and he's troubled in his mind. And that was the perfect scene to shoot because Nick was not happy that we cut his hair. And I think the scene plays good because he's kind of frustrated about that, and it comes through on screen. Most people might think in the beginning of the movie that he's, you know, your typical bully, but there's something behind it. His father passed away when he was young, so this kid tries to put on like a hard exterior, you know, acts tough just to like cover it up. Sorry for the way I am. Sorry for the way I treated Mr. Sperry. And for picking on those kids at school. But I liked working with Taylor. Taylor, uh, he listened to me and uh, he did a great job for me. Hi, I'm Bailey Garnell. Do you have for Tanya? Oh, I'm reading for Tanya. And you're 5'1". And I'm 5'1". <laughs> <Okay, great. laughs> and we love Tanya. She's cute as a button. And uh, we cast her locally in Rochester. All of LA, we search for a Tanya and we couldn't really find a girl that I was happy with. We go to Rochester, New York and like the first girl that walks in and read is, is Bailey Garno and Chad Gunderson and myself. It takes us about 10 seconds to decide this girl is perfect. And I thought she did a great job. Let me see that note. Hey, give me that. It's my note. I don't want to see that. She wrote it to me. Oh, let me see what it says. I'm going to read it first. Come on. Let's see what it says. Okay. All right, I'll read it to you. We love Dustin's mom, played by Mira Jean Bentley. I played Mrs. Sharp, and she is a single mom. She lost her husband a while ago. And she's, she works hard, and she has a little 13-year-old son whom she loves dearly and um, still tries to instill the family values by having dinner on the table every night. Dustin, please try to eat something. You'll feel better. No, I won't. I know this has been hard for you the past few days, but you need to start moving forward again with your life. And we were looking at three different actresses, and when she came in to read, Gavin just happened to be there. So he came in to watch the read. I remember she's reading the part where she's talking to Dustin, telling about Mr. Barnes, and she's crying. And I look over, and Gavin's crying watching her do it. And she was terrific. Very professional, very easy to work with. And uh, we just loved her. It, it just uh, she became a good friend, and I'm proud of MJ. She really delivers. You know Jesus, don't you, Mr. Barnes? What kind of a question is that? I loved working with Robert Guillaume. I thought he was perfect for the role of Mr. Barnes. He was my first choice. Turn that thing off. Oh, don't worry. It won't take me long. I'll do a good job. And I want you to tell me once and for all, who put you up to this? We needed somebody that could play grumpy. And, uh, you know, sadly, Robert had a stroke back in 1999, and, uh, you know, he used that to even give the, make the part more powerful. I see him, feel him as a uh, black man from the South in the 40s. He's got a set of old-fashioned values and an attitude of respect and dignity at the same time. And I can't let you mow my lawn anymore unless you let me pay you. Are we in agreement? You don't have to, Mr. Barnes. Are we in agreement? I feel a great warmth and depth in this character. You know, the last scene when Mr. Barnes comes over to see Dustin, Robert is a pretty emotional guy. And he had trouble doing that scene because it got to him. It, 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 it got to him as he was delivering those lines. And lots of times he would kind of even break down. I know you're feeling sad about Mr. Sperry, you know. We all are. If there was ever a Christian man in this town. It was, it was Johnson Sperry. What a powerful line. What a powerful moment that, that we captured there on film. I just fell apart. I, I didn't want to, but I, I had to reach down so deeply to contact the very simple emotions that were in the script. I was surprised by it all, but grateful. He cared about the character. He wanted it to be good, and I think we captured some Thank good emotion you. in that last scene, and it's terrific. And uh, it was just a thrill to work with him. He enjoyed doing the movie. We worked with him three days, and um, I love Robert. He, he's great. Second day with Robert Guillaume. Nice guy. Funny guy. Fun working with him. When people watch this film, it looks very simple on screen. It was very difficult to shoot. I'll tell you why. The biggest problem we had was the weather. 
the weather was all over the map. Trying to shoot a summer movie, we start shooting late in upstate New York, start shooting at the end of August. I stayed away from July because I thought it'd be too hot. And uh, rain every other day it felt like, and a lot of cloud cover. When you start shooting a scene outside with outside sun, like let's say you're going to shoot a close-up of one of the kids and there's sun in the background, well when the cloud cover comes over, it knocks the sun out. Literally, there were times where we stood there for 15 or 20 minutes waiting for a cloud to clear out. And it's simple shoot, just smooth sailing all the way through. Smooth sailing. <laughs> the weather was great. Also, 40% of this movie was shot outside, and you're dealing with lawnmowers and dogs barking and kids crying. We've got ADs running all over the place to try to keep people quiet. We're very excited about this film as the truck goes by. We know that when we come into these elements, whether it be weather, whether it be noise five blocks away that we can't control. Always a challenge shooting outside with the noise. Like right now we're waiting for a truck over here to stop and move away. So delays, delays. Did I say we shot a movie with kids, by the way? Folks around here call me W. <laughs> they always say never work with animals or children. I always wondered why they said that. Now I know. I do all my own he just, stunts. He can't help all it. All of them, I skateboard, I snowboard. He's mentally challenged, he can't help it. First of all, I love these kids. They'll be special to me for the rest of my life. But when it comes time to shoot, kind of tough to corral them to get it set up. And uh, the boys love being in the makeup chair. They love talking to the makeup girl. Put the camera on Gina. <laughs> Gina is the best makeup in there. We all love Put the Gina. camera on Gina. Yes! And uh, these guys are full of energy. I mean, they're just going back and forth, left and right, so that was always a challenge, just to simmer everybody down so that we could shoot the scenes. La, 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 la. You know, people don't realize little things that come up when you're shooting a movie. We had an issue with bees. Bees are everywhere. Our set nurse, Melinda, got stung by one of the bees. Bees coming on set, you know, our food, we were trying to eat, but just getting in scenes. Bees have been a terrible problem. I mean, all over the place. You know, in the director's eye, you know, like when he's trying to watch the monitor, like, like me right now. <laughs> and it's just, it's just wild, they're everywhere. <laughs> that was an issue, we had to deal with it. Sprays and all sorts of things. And there's a bee. Just, you never know what you're going to get, especially when you're shooting outside. These are some of the problems you encounter. <laughs> so it was an experience, and always every day in shooting this movie, I'm feeling pressure because Philip Hearn and myself, the DP, we need to make the day, as they say. And what that is, let's say we're going to go shoot a scene on the bridge. Well, we might shoot two scenes on the first day, and it might have eight shots. You want to make sure you get all eight shots done that day. The last thing you want to do is have to come back the next day and finish shooting like the last shot and then move the company to a different location. You want to always try to shoot out the locations when you can and make the days. And that's the pressure we feel in shooting a movie. Okay, here we go, everybody. And I didn't think the shooting schedule was that hard, but it seemed like every day we were shooting, it was getting tougher and tougher to make the days. Okay, cut it. That was good. One more, Phil. One more. Cut it. Go in again. Cut I want to tell you the Holy Spirit is all over this company. I just thank God for getting us through every day. You got bogeys underneath. Bogeys? People that aren't supposed to be there. So you put that all together, and the Sperry movie, although a labor of love, was a very difficult shoot. Okay, cut it, cut it, cut it. I want to thank Rich for writing this part and allowing me to really use whatever gifts God has given me to make this man live. Well, when I wrote this movie, you were always Jonathan Sperry, so it's a dream for me that, to yeah. have you play it. Thanks, so, Rich. God love bless you, brother. you. You too. Oh, Rich. What to say about Rich? Give us a Rich impression real quick. Now. Here's Rich. <laughs> guys, guys, Phil, will you just, just let me do it, Phil? <laughs> no, I never said it. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, here we go. So misleading. I just don't like that. <laughs> Rich is, is, he's an amazing guy. I mean, he's got such a very specific vision. Um, his vision is very spot on, and he knows when he's got it, he's got it, and we can move on, and, and we can continue on with our day, but until we get what he wants, um, and that is encouraging about a director. Okay, cut it for a second, but stay there, Robert. Right. Stay there. It's been wonderful working with Rich. He wrote the script also, and uh, the uh, scenes that I'm in are deceptively deep and his desire to see these things come to life were, were a revelation and interesting. Okay, cut it, cut it, cut it, cut roll it. him again. When I first read the script, I realized, wow, 
He's not only a talented writer, but when I got to work with him, what a fabulous director. He just has a way of putting an actor at ease, and he allows the actor to just give what they have. Okay, cut it. Cut it. Rich, he is such a great guy. He really, he doesn't do this. A lot of people do this for the money, but he does it for a little more. He's put his heart into this film. He's very focused, and he's really working to make it the best it can be. Okay, here we go, ready? He helped me a lot with my lines. He helped me get into my character. And whenever um, I was having issues, like remembering what I was supposed to say or how I was supposed to act, he was there and he was helping me out. So I really appreciated him being there for me. Day 10, Nick's first shot. Rich, he's a great director. Action! I think we can relate to each other a lot because we're both Christians. He can, I think, relate to me really good when we're filming. You having fun? Yeah. Huh? Come on now, say hi to the camera. Hi. We both just have something good about each other and he's really nice and I like him a lot. He's one of my favorite directors I've ever worked with for sure, yeah. Just re-slate, let's pick up from right there, don't move. He's got a hat. Let me tell you about the hat. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I would love to work with Rich again, <laughs> and I want to thank him for such a wonderful opportunity. It was a real blessing. Chad Gunderson's another guy that worked hard on this movie. He co-produced the movie with me, and we flew up to upstate New York a couple months before we started, and we found all the locations. Rich and I came up here uh, mid-summer or so, started scouting locations up here in the Rochester area, and um, he always wanted to shoot a, a film back here in his, his home state, his home area, so Rochester is where we ended up. Right now it's August 25th, 2007, and that's Chad behind me. He's the producer. He's been with me from the start here. He's a phenomenal person, and not only is he a great producer, but just a great Christian man. He sets an example for all of us to look up to. And by the I way, really the best <laughs> actor in this movie, the pizza guy, is the pizza guy. Action. Spot on. Any, any, spot. Spot on. Uh, I don't one, know why we did so many <laughs> takes. Okay. Reset, 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 position one. Here we go. Wasn't you, it was those kids. <laughs> those kids. Those darn kids. Flies. <laughs> Flies. Noise. Noise. And, ready, Phil? Action. Well, hopefully we can work together again. Um, you know, hopefully many, many more films to come. Can you believe we put our whole movie on this <laughs> little kid? If I do another movie, Chad will be the guy that I'll approach first to, to, to produce. If we can hit this scene, this is it. This really helps. It'll be a big day. This is a big day. So, and then of course the cameraman here, Mr. DP Phil. There's Philip, our man, as he towers over both of us. Philip Hearn, who's the DP cameraman, who's done all three of the films that I've done, is just a rock for me on set because he's just as concerned as I am to get you know good performances and to make sure we finish our days. And Phil just does a tremendous job. I, I want to do every film with Phil, and uh, the look of this movie, I mean, the lighting and just the camera work I think is excellent. It's photographed in upstate New York and the locations are just absolutely gorgeous, just beautiful. Um, our biggest problem was weather. We got here a little late. It's about 55 degrees. It's supposed to look like summer. It should. It's a summer story and everything just has to be sunny has to be in the sun. We have said lots of prayers for the sun to come out, and apparently the Lord is answering our prayers. So we spent a lot of time waiting on clouds, but it was worth it. The film is going to look really beautiful. A lot of independent films, you know, their scope is very, very small, and you don't get a lot of these bigger shots uh, of streets and downtown areas and stuff like that. Um, and we definitely had a, a big undertaking in getting a lot of those shots, but I think in the end they really, really look good. One of my most favorite shots is uh, Mr. Barnes uh, observing uh, Mr. Uh, Sperry's funeral. And uh, we got there real early in the morning. Uh, we had no lights, basically had to use mirrors and reflectors to kind of bounce light around. But it is one of the most beautiful shots, I think, in the whole movie. You see him walking away from camera towards this beautiful old Packard. And if that is in production value, I don't know what is. What a beautiful shot. As an editor, you want as many takes as possible to be usable. And the thing about Phil Hearn is he knocks it out of the park constantly. He is a great director of photography. I've edited several films featuring his photography, and he makes my job easier. Well, here we are on our last day, and it's supposed to be sunshine. 
I don't have it. So we're using this big light and the camera on to make some shots. What Phil does good is, first of all, he's a very good cameraman. He's just, he's great camera work. He does a good job in shot composition, um, finding shots, and um, we just have a good working relationship. Who's who on this table, and I'll tell you. Okay, I'm Dustin. Okay, so Jonathan just went from here to here. Yeah. Uh, I understand how he works, he understands how I work, and uh, we're patient with one another, but Phil, to me, has been a joy, all three of these movies, all three of these. He, he supports me all the way, and I think that we've worked well together. You did a great job, Phil. Thank you. I love the music in this movie, and Jasper is a brilliant guy. He's such a creative guy. I mean, to start with a blank sheet of paper and to come up with these themes, and the music in this movie is so rich. I know the Sperry movie is not an action film, and Jasper's music just sets the tone to bring us back to 1970 to a simpler time. Now. <laughs> It's a beautiful score that I absolutely love, and he just did a tremendous job. I've done two other films with Rich, uh, did both uh, Time Changer and Unidentified, and um, it's just a natural progression that uh, he knows that when he has another film ready to give me a call, and I'll make sure that my schedule allows for me to work with him. It's always a pleasure. We did an original score. We went down to the Eastwood stage in Warner Brothers. We had over 30 people in the orchestra that do a live score. and. You know, I was proud of Jasper Randall as he's conducting the orchestra, and I'm sitting in the control room, but I can see the movie behind Jasper. The players are reading the music as they're playing. Whenever you have live players, it just takes it to a whole nother level. Something that uh, synthesizers and computers uh, can't accomplish, it's that human aspect. Something that I knew from the beginning was going to be very important. Uh, for, for um, the success of this music and for this movie. We're really blessed to have Jasper on this film. His music really takes the project up to the next level. Jasper Randall is simply a godsend. You know, it was fantastic. I was proud of him. And at the end of the whole session, we did like 30-some pieces. You know, they all gave Jasper a big ovation because they knew this young man had just knocked out one terrific score. When you're editing the film, that's when you can save it and make it work. Jeff Hollis, who's my editor, nobody works longer on any project other than myself than Jeff Hollis. And the way Jeff and I work is simply this. I give the movie to Jeff and I say, Jeff, you edit this movie any way you want. And always, always, always I get a better movie this way because Jeff comes up with things that I've never even thought of. Like the Dustin mowing the lawn. We had trouble shooting that day. Literally, I gave him nothing to work with. I mean, nothing. And yet, he made that sequence work. Another thing that Jeff does that I like is cutaways. He's the master of the cutaways. Just choosing cutaways, that's, it's harder than you think. I mean, he just finds little shots that just perfectly fit. I, I, to me, that's his forte. This is not an action film, and people think that action films are the hardest to cut. This type of film is the hardest to cut, I'll tell you right now. You really like her, don't you? Yes. I really like her. I'm not afraid to say it. Cutting dialogue is tough. Figuring out the right pauses, when do we cut away, it's, it's really a challenge. Cutting an action scene is easy. You, you, you have an explosion, a car chase and everything. That's no problem. Cutting dialogue and finding the moments that really work between the characters, that's really difficult. Both of us want to try to do the best we can and we take the time to work it and I appreciate working with Jeff. It's been a good collaboration. Modern technology is great and on this film we really utilized it. After Rich finishes shooting the film, he's about 110 miles apart from me. So what we do is I finish cutting the scene and I email him a quick time. After he looks at the quick time, he emails me his notes, and then I recut the scene, send him another quick time, and we repeat that process until we're reasonably happy with the cut. You really like her, don't you? Then we spend about a week together in person, just tweaking the film and trying to get it to where we're happy with it. There's a lot to editing a movie. 
you got to make, it's hundreds of decisions. That's really what editing is, decisions. And uh, the fact that Jeff has edited a number of films, he's got little techniques he uses, and he just has a feel of what works. We really work hard to make every scene as good as we can. We leave no stone unturned, and you know, editing is all about making the right decisions. It's hundreds and thousands of decisions, and we agonize over each one sometimes, but in the end, it's all worth it. As far as locations go, it was supposed to be um, set in 1970, and Rich said he wanted to reflect sort of his childhood, which was in Waterloo, New York, which is a smaller town. So we wanted to go for that small town feeling in 1970. But because it was a small town and because it was 1970, it was mostly influenced by the 60s. And um, Jonathan Sperry's was a little more challenging because his house would probably be more influenced by the 40s and 50s. So it was more of a an older Victorian feel to his home because he was an older gentleman. And um, the rest of the movie we wanted to reflect on sort of middle America, 1960s. So the whole point of the sets and the props and all this is to bring back nostalgia and to set the time and the place. And um, we tried to do that. James really helped us to, to really kind of pull things back a little bit and it's very authentic and I think it looks great. So you want them about that level? As far as challenges on the set, there were many, um, but I, I guess time was a, a big challenge. And um, just going into pre-existing locations and having to work with some pre-existing colors and uh, structures and, uh, and architecture of the buildings was 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 a challenge. Like the pizza place was a pre-existing diner, I believe, and uh, the whole thing was white. So we had to find ways to break up the white so it didn't look like a uh, large white mass. So we <laughs> put up checked curtains and put up paneling, which everyone loves. And so that worked out nicely. James, the production is done right there. That's the guy right there. He's done an excellent job. Especially turning this place around. We put the paneling up, brought in these little... Uh, Red things. These are our chairs. I guess the hardest thing in a low-budget film is um, doing a period piece, is finding everything for it and staying within budget. And um, so I guess the biggest challenge for the art department, including wardrobe and hair and makeup, was um, creating that whole 60s feel. I love the look of the movie. I thought the production designer, James Cunningham, did a fantastic job with the sets. For example, Dustin's house, there's nothing in that house. We rented that house. There was nothing in there. Everything in that house he put in there. All the boys' bedrooms, Dustin, Mark, Albert, and Nick, those were completely empty bedrooms, and he had to give them four different motifs. He did a terrific job in coming up with all that stuff. I remember he went around all these estate sales trying to buy little things that he could put in there, a little horse, a little this, you know, a pennant, whatever he bought. Uh, amazing job James Cunningham did, amazing. We had a very good production team, very talented guys. Stephen Cujay, who was the costume designer. I mean, think about it. Every costume has to be before 1970, and some of the opening sequence, we had all those extras on the street there. You know, Stephen is, he's outstanding. He's been doing this for a long time, and, and he's very well known within the industry, especially with the 50s and 60s type eras. The story actually takes place in 1970, but it being a small town, they wouldn't be up on the fashion at the moment. So we used as a reference point the late middle 60s, there would be the style of clothing that people would wear. The wardrobe on this was so beautiful and so authentic to the 1960s. It, it was amazing. It was like I was kind of stepping back into time. Uh, as you know, a film is shot out of sequence, and part of the job of costume is to keep uh, continuity, to make sure that the actors are dressed in the right costume for the, when we shoot uh, sequential scenes. What we do is we take okay. photos, and we write the scene numbers, and we also keep a written description. Example, here's Jonathan Sperry's change book. Uh, Gavin is first change one, scenes eight, ten, eleven. This is what he's wearing, a written description of it, followed by a picture of it. And that happens for every costume. So the, so one day when we're shooting scene eight, and then a week later when we're shooting scene eleven, we're guaranteed that things are gonna look the same. And then we, this happens for each character. Um, in addition to writing it down and taking a photo of it, each article is tagged as well. This is Mark's change one, it's in scene four, one, three, four, five, seven. That happens with every article of clothing. Our main characters, their costumes are pulled first and foremost, and then what's left over 
we generally use as background for um, extras walking through the scenes, extras seated in the diner when we're shooting that, and people driving by in cars, you have to put the shirts on them. I'm very happy to be working on this film. I think Rich has written a meaningful film, and I feel that he is filming a meaningful film, and I believe that it, it tells an important story. You know, I love doing Christian films. First of all, movies are an entertainment medium, but we're trying to do a message for the Lord, a message that can inspire people, that can uplift them. This movie hopefully causes people to think about important spiritual matters. We know that in the end we're doing something for Christ here and we're doing something that is going to, you know, forward His kingdom. Of all the parts I played in my life, nothing, nothing comes close to Jonathan Sperry. To be able to say the things that he says and to have it captured on film is the pinnacle of any kind of work I've had an opportunity to do. So we hope this gets out so millions and millions of people can see this and ultimately have their lives changed. Lord Jesus is here for you, Nick, just like he was for your father. Just call out to him. You know the path you're on is the wrong one. It's extremely powerful. I think it's going to touch people in ways that uh, they didn't expect. Oh, I thought you might like to know I've been reading my Bible. Just like you said. Gospel of John, reading all about Jesus. You know, before we showed this movie in theaters, we first screened it at some Christian film festivals. And the first one we ever showed this movie at was in Boston. In that particular film festival, Tom Saab, at the end of the movie, would talk to the people and, and give an invitation to try to encourage people to give their lives to Christ. And we saw people give their lives to Christ that week. It made you cry. It made you happy. It just made you want to get out there and go out there and tell others about Christ. It made 90% of the audience cry because Jesus touches those who hear and those who want to be saved. It was life-changing for my daughter and for her friend because my daughter recommitted her life to the Lord and her friend asked Jesus into their hearts. There were over 100 people that walked down to say, hey, I want to get right with the Lord after watching this movie. I mean, you can't put a value on that. My passion is to work on Christian films because when people see these films, sometimes they make decisions for Christ and that is worth a billion dollar paycheck. The film is, itself is really inspirational. I think it's going to be a really inspiring movie. It really, it moves me. Yeah, I cried. It was so real for me watching the kids on camera and Jonathan Sperry. I, I was just taken back right to the 70s, but uh, it was very emotional and I, a great movie. This movie is about relationships. This movie is about forgiveness. This movie is about, you know, reading your Bible, following the Lord, trying to do some things that are right. And in our society today, we're just blinded by all the glitz. We're blinded by all the lights, blinded by the, what the world's trying to sell you. you. You've got to just start realizing what is really important in life. You know, I think about this movie because it's a small kind of movie. It's not one of those great big things. But like uh, Mother Teresa said, do small things with great love. And there's great love on this set. And I know it's going to transmit to the audience. I'm praying that this film just um, is an amazing success. To me, doing these films has a real sense of purpose, and that's why I like doing them. I want to try to please the Lord first with the work, and then hopefully the message of this movie will speak to people's hearts. Now you keep talking about Jesus. You hear, Dustin? Some folks out there just might be listening. You know, I just feel that society needs a, a little more lift a lift that, you know, the Lord is, is in everybody's life and, um, and He's watching over us. God bless to everyone and I hope this film made an impact in your life.